Chapter 23, Hope of the Church This is from the Review of June 10, 1852. As I have of late looked around to find the humble followers of the meek and lowly Jesus, my mind has been much exercised. Many who profess to be looking for the speedy coming of Christ are becoming conformed to this world, and seek more earnestly the applause of those around them than the approbation of God. They are cold and formal, like the nominal churches from which they but a short time since separated. The words addressed to the Laodicean church describe their present condition perfectly. See Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 to 20. They are neither cold nor hot, but lukewarm. And unless they heed the counsel of the faithful and true witness, and zealously repent, and obtain gold tried in the fire, white raiment, and eye salve, he will spew them out of his mouth. The time has come when a large portion of those who once rejoiced and shouted aloud for joy in view of the immediate coming of the Lord are on the ground of the churches and the world who once derided them for believing that Jesus was coming and circulated all manner of falsehoods to raise prejudice against them and destroy their influence. Now, if anyone longs after the living God, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, and God gives them to feel His power, and satisfy their longing souls by shedding abroad His love in their hearts, and if they glorify God by praising Him, they are, by these professed believers in the soon coming of the Lord, often considered deluded, and charged with being mesmerized or having some wicked spirit. Many of these professed Christians dress, talk, and act like the world, and the only thing by which they may be known is their profession. Though they profess to be looking for Christ, their conversation is not in heaven, but on worldly things. What manner of persons ought those to be in all holy conversation and godliness, who profess to be looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God? 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11 Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. 1 John chapter 3, verse 3 but it is evident that many who bear the name of Adventist study more to decorate their bodies and to appear well in the eyes of the world than they do to learn from the word of God how they may be approved of him. What if the lovely Jesus, our pattern, should make his appearance among them and the professors of religion generally as at his first advent? He was born in a manger, Follow him through his life and ministry. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. These professed Christians would be ashamed of the meek and lowly Savior who wore a plain, seamless coat and had not where to lay his head. His spotless, self-denying life would condemn them. His holy solemnity would be a painful restraint upon their lightness and vain laughter. His guileless conversation would be a check to their worldly and covetous conversation. His declaring the unvarnished, cutting truth would manifest their real character, and they would wish to get the meek pattern, the lovely Jesus, out of the way as soon as possible. They would be among the first to try to catch him in his words, and raise the cry, Crucify him! Crucify him! Let us follow Jesus as he so meekly rode into Jerusalem when the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you, that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. A large portion of those who profess to be looking for Christ would be as forward as the Pharisees were to have the disciples silenced, and they would doubtless raise the cry, Fanaticism! Mesmerism! Mesmerism! And the disciples spreading their garments and branches of palm trees in the way would be thought extravagant and wild. But God will have a people on the earth who will not be so cold and dead 
but that they can praise and glorify Him. He will receive glory from some people, and if those of His choice, those who keep His commandments, should hold their peace, the very stones would cry out. Jesus is coming, but not as at his first advent, a babe in Bethlehem, not as he rode into Jerusalem, when the disciples praised God with a loud voice and cried, Hosanna! But in the glory of the Father, and with all the retinue of holy angels to escort him on his way to earth, all heaven will be emptied of the angels, while the waiting saints will be looking for him, and gazing into heaven, as were the men of Galilee when he ascended from the Mount of Olivet. Then only those who are holy, those who have followed fully the meek pattern, will with rapturous joy exclaim as they behold him, Lo, this is our God, we have waited for him, and he will save us. And they will be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump that trump which wakes the sleeping saints and calls them forth from their dusty beds, clothed with glorious immortality and shouting, Victory! Victory over death and the grave! The changed saints are then caught up together with the angels to meet the Lord in the air, never more to be separated from the object of their love. With such a prospect as this before us, such a glorious hope, such a redemption that Christ has purchased for us by His own blood, shall we hold our peace? Shall we not praise God even with a loud voice, as did the disciples when Jesus rode into Jerusalem? Is not our prospect far more glorious than was theirs? Who dare then forbid us glorifying God, even with a loud voice, when we have such a hope, big with immortality and full of glory? We have tasted of the powers of the world to come, and long for more. My whole being cries out after the living God, and I shall not be satisfied until I am filled with all His fullness.